Welcome to this new video lecture for the course Multimodal Communication. This is the fourth of five video lectures introducing the concept and research area of multimodality. So far we've discussed in these lectures how multimodality is defined, where it originates and in which situations it is at work. This lecture now gives again more details about what multimodality actually is and how we define its basic concepts. With this, the lecture summarizes the content of chapter 4 of the underlying textbook. In the focus of this lecture are again important key terms for our research on multimodal artifacts and performances. And finally, we are coming to the central notion of multimodality, the notion of the semiotic mode or modality. We will get to know a proper and comprehensive definition of semiotic modes and discuss its applicability to concrete analyses. It is again important that we do not just learn by heart some abstract concepts and definitions, but that we see from the very beginning how these concepts provide steps and tools to perform analyses and to achieve important results. As we say in the book, semiotic modes form the foundation for any real account of multimodality and so they need to be characterized in a way that is robust enough for driving empirical research. At the same time, the definition should of course be open for theoretical and methodological developments that might be necessary when we meet new media developments or technologies, for example. In the second part of this lecture, we will then put the characterization of semiotic modes in relation to the notions of text and discourse. These notions are important to show how semiotic modes are used in concrete contexts and what is needed to analyze them comprehensively. Okay, what now is a mode and how is it defined in the context of multimodality research? Chapter 1 of the textbook gives an overview of some of the most prominent definitions of semiotic modes in the multimodality context. Some of these definitions share, for example, that modes should always involve the perceptual senses. But with this, it's difficult to describe gesture, speech or writing also as modes. Other definitions simply list various expressive forms that contribute to a meaning-making situation without any further explanation. Looking at these definitions, it is then by no means clear what exactly one can do with them and how they might help pursuing some analysis. What we need instead is a working definition that can be put to use in actual analysis. And this is what we're going to work through now here in these slides. Admittedly, definitions are always theoretically dense and often seem to be too abstract. And this will perhaps also first be the case for the definition we will discuss on the next slide. but. We will definitely see later how this definition can be used for practical analyses. Let's go. Every semiotic mode combines three semiotic levels. The material dimension, the technical features organized along several axes of description, which is described as form here, and the level of discourse semantics. This definition has first been discussed in several publications by John Bateman from the last couple of years. In the textbook, we give a much shorter explanation of these details and summarize it in this graphical illustration. Let's do a step-by-step -step description of all three levels of the semiotic mode in order to get through this successfully. We've already discussed that the material level plays an important role for multimodality and that it is also an important part of the definition of a mode. The material side determines which manipulation of this material are used by the sign producer within a purposeful articulation. This is captured in the concept of the canvas, which we introduced in the third lecture. The material of a your nodes can have different forms and properties, but it is important that these forms and properties are controllable by the producer to purposefully create meaning. And it is important that it is perceptible for the recipient. 
while sometimes involving multiple sensory channels. We can see here then that this is a combination of both a material and a semiotic side in the semiotic mode. If we take these presentation slides as an example, their different forms of material are used to purposefully create meaning. There are, for example, the letters of the written language, as used in the title of the slide or in the top right corner. There are also lines and colors that are arranged in a certain way to organize the slide in some sort of layout. There are images or diagrams. These different types of material can usually be used in various media and for the presentation slides, I choose a specific form that is, at the same time, pre-given by the software to create these slides. This form is described on the second level of the semiotic mode as the so-called technical features of the mode. This level tells us how the material is formed into a classification or paradigm of units and how these units are syntagmatically combined with other units. For the presentation slides, this means that there are, for example, some layout options available how to design and organize the content of my slides. I can choose templates for specific styles or the arrangement of text boxes, for example. I can also choose from a set of colors available to further design my boxes. Or I can choose from a pre-given set a specific font style to be used for the written language. These are then all technical features of the semiotic mode of presentation slides. Since you should be familiar with how presentation slides are usually designed and which features might be used to display some kind of information, you also know how to read and interpret them. This is what is captured on the third level of the semiotic mode, the level of discourse semantics, that makes the semiotic mode interpretable in context. The level of discourse semantics gives us hints and cues or an interpretation scheme how to interpret the combination of material and form. This level contains knowledge about the context in which the semiotic mode is usually used or more specifically used in a particular specific situation, such as the one in this video. And it also provides knowledge about how things in the world usually are or how they can be related to each other or how things in a specific genres can usually be understood. So we could also call this level the level of meaning construction that brings with it the needed patterns of use and design to interpret the combination of material and form. We mainly know these patterns already for verbal modes, thus for spoken or written language for which we can describe things like cohesion or coherence, relations holding between sentences, thematic progression, and many more. Many of these patterns are indeed applicable to nonverbal material, but it is always an empirical task to check this applicability. Important for our example is also that you perhaps know the corporate design of the University of Groningen and that you recognize it from the very beginning. This is then an indication of some specific knowledge about this particular context in which the slides are published. People not familiar with this corporate design still bring with them more general knowledge about how to interpret logos, for example. And they usually also know how logos work with specific colors. All these knowledge sources are part of the discourse semantics of a semiotic mode. The graphical illustration shows the interdependence of the three levels, while the material level with its regularities forms a basis for the form level, they are also at the same time surrounded by the level of the discourse semantic, which provides the respective interpretation patterns. With regard to the example of the presentation slides here, it should have become clear that the three levels cannot really be separated from each other but that they are all deeply connected and intertwined. The idea behind this, by the way, that of having several layers or strata, stems from the context of systemic functional linguistics and social semiotics, some of the disciplines we have discussed in lecture two. 
As I just said, in the textbook, we summarize the definition mainly with this graphical illustration and the caption underneath. In a more recent publication, we elaborate on the definition with the text given on the right here. Again, the three most important key terms are marked. Material or materiality, formal units and structures, as well as discourse semantics. While many other definitions of modes often only include the first two levels, it is the third level of the discourse semantics which makes this definition more complex and at the same time unique. Okay, we made it through the abstract part. Now let's see how this definition can be used to do some actual analysis. Here are some example panels from the German graphic novel Kinderland by the artist Marvel from 2014. Kinderland is a typical visual narrative that tells us about the life of the protagonist Mirko in the German Democratic Republic, shortly before the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. The graphic novel is designed with a variety of semiotic elements, such as several lines, drawings, onomatopoetic forms, different color schemes in the background of the panels, and many others. The page layout of the graphic novel is rather regular in some sort of table grid, and sometimes smaller aspects such as speech bubbles or other elements overlap. We will focus here on some little elements in these panels that are used to depict some motion, speed or effect, such as here and here. In the first panel on the left, we see Mirko leaving a building and picking up a card lying on the ground. He is observed by another person whose arm and leg is shown in the right corner of the panel. The depiction of Mirko's movements is supported by lines that are right next to his right foot, as well as by little cloud-like elements that are next to his left foot. In comic elements, in comic analysis, sorry, these elements are called motion lines or speed lines, and they can usually be distinguished according to their use in specific comics. Neil Cohn, a comic scholar, has, for example, analyzed that European comics usually use short lines here, while American comics rather use longer lines, often with a specific color code. The cloud-like elements are not so well discussed in the literature, and the terminology is not straightforward. But usually these elements are described as de depicting some sort of effect, as it is also the case here when the feet of the protagonist are touching the ground or when he's jumping on the sofa. All these discussions in, in descriptions in the literature show that these elements are used quite often with the same material in a specific form and that it is possible to describe patterns and regularities of use for them. This then is exactly indicating that these elements can be seen as functioning as semiotic modes, for which we can describe a specific meaning in a particular context. On the level of the materiality, the elements are basically drawn lines in black color. On the level of form and structure, we can say that they each have a more specific form. The ones are straight and long, the others are cloud-like. Both are separated from the rest of the panel by color. It also becomes clear that both elements extend the meaning of some other elements by adding specific details. And this is then the third level of discourse semantics or of meaning construction in context. The motion lines in combination with the foot show the dynamicity of movement. The clouds depict the result of the movement the step on the ground or the jump on the sofa. This is true for all these elements in the two panels here and for many more in the whole graphic novel. On this basis of this small analysis, it can thus be hypothesized that these motion lines and the cloud elements can be seen as semiotic modes within this graphic novel and probably also within other graphic novels or visual narratives. By describing the patterns of their use and by giving an interpretation scheme, we make available the discourse semantics of these modes. 
It is important that this analysis is a hypothesis on the basis of some qualitative analysis that always needs empirical testing to be verified. Which means that we would need to analyze more of these occurrences in the Kinderland graphic novel and in several different graphic novels in order to be able to say more about the semiotic modes of these lines and clouds. Now look at this third panel from Kinderland, which uses the exact same cloud-like elements, but without the motion lines. Even though we do not know much about the context here, we might be able to see that in this case there is not such a movement effect, especially not because these clouds are arranged differently than the other elements. Instead, here these elements are clearly put next to the head of the character and we might therefore conclude that they rather express something like anger. This interpretation would actually be supported not only by the direct context of this panel, which we cannot see here, but also by some more general interpretation patterns available for comics that describe elements near to a head as emotional state markers, so as carrying a different meaning. What we can see here is that different patterns of discourse semantics are at work and that it is necessary to distinguish these patterns in detail to be able to say more about the status of the semiotic mode in this graphic novel. We can summarize for all these elements in this graphic novel that they function as semiotic modes since they are articulated purposefully in their specific form and structure and that they construct a certain but different meaning in relation to their specific context and specific patterns of use. For comics and graphic novels, this kind of analysis of the semiotic modes is still an interesting and important task within multimodality research. We can of course say something about modes that will be likely when we encounter a comic, such as images and verbal text. And we can also say which ones will not be possible at all, sound for example, but in general there are still many more elements that are not fully and systematically described and for which we might just not know the patterns of use or the needed interpretation schemes that this specific medium brings with it. And with this we also need to explain a further important key term within this context of multimodality, that of medium. What is actually a medium in comparison to a mode? We define medium as a historically stabilized site for the deployment and distribution of some selection of semiotic modes for the achievement of varied communicative purposes. This means that a medium is the place or practice where meaning construction, or as it is expressed here, semiosis, is happening. This meaning construction takes place in the semiotic modes and not in the medium. So semiotic modes are part of a medium, they participate in the medium and they realize the meaning. If we take the example of the graphic novel again, the actual book provides the material out of which meaning can be constructed in the various semiotic modes at play. By seeing the various forms in which the material is used, and by interpreting the patterns these forms show, we create meaning in these modes as part of the medium. And when we create meaning, we create text. In contrast to the rather general understanding of text as written language, we here use a much broader definition of text that is based on linguistic advancement in the last decades. These advancements no longer take only language into consideration, but all sorts of meaning-making elements. These elements need to be combined in a communicative artifact in a structured way. Thus, exactly as we just described this for semiotic modes, in specific forms and structures with clear identifiable interpretation schemes. The text is then the construct you get when you actually use the semiotic modes of a medium to mean something. For our comic book, this means that the text is basically the story you create out of the various modes and their structures, which are in this case mostly narrative structures. 
One further term is still missing in the summary of chapter 4, discourse. Discourse has been used and is used very diversely, depending on various communities in which it is used. We've already heard that it forms an important part of the level of discourse semantics for semiotic mode, and we've also talked about discourse analysis in general. To be clear here, we have to distinguish between discourse on a local level, which is often used as what we just defined as text, thus at the organization of units in a text, their structures and relations. And we have to distinguish discourse in a much broader sense, as a broad context or way of thinking about a certain topic, as for example in the discourse of gender or the corona discourse. For our definition of the semiotic mode, we focus mainly on the discourse with a small d here, the organization of units, or broadly said, the interpretation schemes and patterns that are needed to define a semiotic mode. Nevertheless, we also said that certain knowledge sources from the context or the general world knowledge are important, and to these discourses with a big D here are similarly important. In general, we say that discourse is what happens when we make sense of an unfolding communicative situation. And this is then exactly what drives our analysis. We want to know what kind of activities and meanings are pursued in a communicative situation, with what kind of goals, and with what kinds of expressive forms and materials. The definitions we've learned now give us theory and methods for pursuing these aims. And we will see in the next lecture how we can practically perform these analyses. In this spirit, thank you for your attention and see you for lecture five.